All right, Jordan, thank you so much for being with us today on the Saltivation Podcast. It's nice to have you back. You are our first repeat guest. Uh oh. Wow. <laughs> that I am quite honored. It was uh, great to do it the first time, to do it the second time. The best thing about it, it's probably been a couple of years. There's so much going on. You would think <laughs> right? in most fields, it, like, it, it goes at this glacial pace. Not what we do. No, it's right. Moving. It's great. We're in that right now. So for, you know, anyone who might be new, can you just give us, you have a very long, successful, great history. Could you just give us a brief overview of what you're doing, how you got there, and then we'll dig into the new. Sure. No, Meredith, I, that's a very kind way of saying, Goodman, you're old, but I appreciate that. So it's all good. <laughs> it's a matter how you feel. So it's all good. Uh, let's see. I, I started my career at Arthur Anderson back in the mid 80s when state and local taxes was just getting started. Um, in fact, I was part of the first state and local tax team for Arthur Anderson back in Chicago in 1985, 86 year. And so it was something they said for attorneys in particular, it'd be a fun area, lots of growth, lots of constitutional laws, things that we studied. And, you know, in many ways, they were absolutely right. It's been a great career choice. Um, I, I left there after a couple of years and went to McDermott, Will and Emery, large firm, um, was on the team that argued the Quill case um, before the U.S. Supreme Court, intimately involved in all the mechanisms uh, around that. It was a lot of fun, learned a lot. Uh, and then made the second best decision of my life other than marrying my wife, came to HMB, um, what, formerly known as Ford Marcus and Burke, now HMB Legal Counsel, and uh, worked with Fred Marcus and Marilyn Wethicum and a bunch of other people and just had phenomenal clients, friends. Growth of the area has been great. We do just about anything in the, in the tax field. And it's we we're just talking about there's just so much going on. It's always challenging. And I still love it. And it's just great. There's so much to do. That's awesome to still love it. That's a good sign for those of you considering a career like this, which most people oh don't. I know, no, <laughs> but think about it. I mean, it, it, I will say every day. I remember when Wayfair came out, we are like, oh my God, half my work is going to go away. Next is for sales tax. And right. all it's done has been busier since then. I mean, it wasn't yeah. right. And then we talk about public 86, 272 going away. That's a whole different field that's potentially open now to defend and fight against that. There's always business. Remember, Judy, business and non-business income used to be a huge issue. And right. now we fight about not whether it's business income, but about factor representation. And right. there's, you know, that's, and that's what we're seeing right now. There's always something new and fun that's going on, keeping it interesting and different. We're not doing the same thing over and over again. Right. Yeah. When I think on that too, right at the at the end of the day, states are led by people, and humans can change, and legislate legislators can change, and policy can change. And so when you're right, when you're governed by people you have an opportunity for change and, you know, there could be a different department, you know, le uh, leader of the department of revenue and they decide to change X, Y, Z, right. Colorado used to be pretty easy ish when it came to like income tax, even we're going to ignore sales tax. But then over the last couple of years, they've decoupled from everything. They've, you know, I think it, a lot of it really started with Oracle and talking about like the unity and the foreign activity. And so, yeah, the end of the day, people change, policy changes, and therefore we have to adjust. Yeah, and then got our businesses change, though, don't you think? I mean, all of us are talking right now because of the internet, because of Wi-Fi. I mean, that is a crazy pivot, and and anybody could touch anybody and have a client just about anywhere now if you're willing to do it via Zoom or Teams or whatever, right? So that has really changed the character of how people can market and increase their their customer profile. And I even think the competition among the states and the locals now, you know, are really emphasized because everybody went to a single sales factor because there's a way that could be competitive with the Iowa that had it from the beginning, right? Now we got to import it, but now they're realizing there's, there's limitations to that and they've got to look at things differently. And then, you know, increasing the rates becomes a challenge. You can't do it beyond a certain amount in elasticity of demand with tax rates. Got to expand the base. Well, what's expanding? Stuff related to the internet, services, digital products. You know, the future, I won't say looks bright, but the future for SALT practitioners, there's going to be plenty to do and plenty to figure out over the next generation of, of people like us. 
Well, and that's interesting that you said, because we had a conversation very recently with, um, you know, a senior tax policy analyst at the Tax Foundation. And she, we were talking about some of the states that had done rate reductions and, you know, why maybe some of that is, and it's because of competition. And you never kind of like think about, I guess, you know, being vulnerable, right? I hadn't necessarily thought about that. I was like, well, yeah, there is a lot of, there is a lot to that. Right. No. And, and, you know, and, and the thing that's interesting is that governments are run by politicians. Politicians run for reelection. How do you get reelected? At least the, the olden days was based upon lowering the tax burden or doing this or whatever else. Right. So if, if you could campaign with saying we're going to get rid of the corporate head income tax. Oh, but by the way, we're going to have to raise other taxes to balance that out. I mean, state budgets are state budgets, but now they're saying we want to reduce the rate. It seems attractive, but state spending rarely goes down. And this is, you know, this is what the cyclical nature of it is. We're coming off the post pandemic years in 21, 22, where the uh, excess, the reserves were refilled at all the states. And so they're reducing everything. But now we're like, before this year got to August, September, we were supposed to be in a recession. Everybody got nervous about it. It's got to start right. looking at new ways, right? So it's be driven by the economy and how much they have in there and, and who they want to benefit. Really, just that's what makes it, change is good. Jordan, as you spoke to kind of state coffers, right? We were at IPT in Dallas and what the comptroller of Texas came and liked to, and spoke very highly of the amount of excess that Texas had. And so very shortly thereafter, there was the announcement that they increased the minimum tax or the no tax due threshold. I think they doubled it. They got rid of the no tax due return. So just from a franchise tax perspective, you know, Texas did some things to modify that. I don't know if, you know, that was a result of excess or it was a coincidence, but I don't know that there are much things that are coincidences when it comes to, you know, fiscal policy. Or it was an election year. Fair. And when you do, right, and when you do things for small businesses and individuals, they vote, right? And outside of Citizens United, they're the ones who are ultimately deciding who gets put in the office, and you make things a little bit better for them in the year or the year before election. And you know, but to covers. lower rates or take away a base, that's a big deal. I feel like we've big been deal. seeing more adding to a base. You know, the digital advertising, Nevada Commerce, what eight nine years ago, that was sort of like, I, are you kidding me? You know, and now we're seeing this digital ads taken. Now it's getting some legs. Wayfair, Definitely. obviously, which I think, you know, we knew that was needed to happen because we we're seeing too much e-commerce eviscerating right. Main Street so, America, but still. Capital gains in Washington or excise tax, whatever you want to call it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll find out. That's, you know, one of the cases we'll get an answer in hopefully in 2024 if they take the case. Um, but you're right. No, and that's, that's, that's that creativity between, you know, whether it's the government looking for an ability to raise revenue without offending the electorate by putting it on people that you could point to, whether it's corporations, which always was the, the tag, but now it's wealthy individuals. They don't pay their fair share. So you're kind of pushing the burden out to other people and the wealthy people, they only get one vote. So, you know, that's, it's, it's a very good common man type argument. Uh, but it's, you know, I, and we're not done because, States are only limited by what their state constitution and the federal constitution or the state federal statutes say, right? So there's a lot more base out there that we haven't tapped into. And you're right, Judy, the whole digital world, we're just tapping it. I mean, I've read how many articles in the last month about cryptocurrency and why aren't we taxing it? Now, I, I, I'm not, I will never lecture on what cryptocurrency is or is not. I kind of accept what everybody else has said and just go with that. I, I, but it seems to me it's, it is a area where there is profit loss and certainly proceeds. And why wouldn't it be taxed? Right. Well, but even not, sales tax, I mean, a token, a token, you know, a gaming token could be a, a fungible thing. I mean, I don't know. There's some, even sales tax world, world is impacted by that crypto. Um, right. And, and again, Free. All kinds of things in the app world is uh, digital that is potentially taxable for some reason or another. It'll be interesting because I, I do have a client that is a um, a precious metal exchange, okay? And they've done a really good job of going around the country and getting laws to, 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 to uh, remove it from sales tax 
likening to currency. And then you got crypto, even that has currency in the word, right? Cryptocurrency. And it's a question of, well, is it really currency? Is it not? It's traded. But back in the olden days, we had sheep and cows and goats that we traded to as currency. Certainly no one would say that it was currency. You know, certainly represents a value. It's not issued by any government. It's not regulated by any government um, per se. So it, it, there's a there is a vast amount of base still out there to be taxed either on a gross receipts tax, sales tax, or even some kind of income tax. Right. And the payroll taxes seem to be rearing their ugly heads. I was just reading, you know, we've got that going on in Washington state where they're kind of going after the um the the payroll, like just to get a little extra cash, you know, let's go after your payroll. To, yeah, no, it, it, here, our, our new mayor, Brandon Johnson, in Chicago, has talked about reinstating what we used to call the head tax. You have more than 40 employees in the city, and then you pay $5 a quarter on every employee over the city, which is the reason why they got rid of it is so anti-competitive. Move, move your 1,000 people into the city, and you'll pay on 960 of them, which is just bizarre. But again, uh, certainly city of Chicago, state of Illinois does have some budgetary concerns and that's a way to go at it. Yep. No, because we have one in Denver, we have an OP, occupational privilege tax and we have five cities in Colorado, some of which no one's even heard of that has one. So 68 bucks a year, some de minimis amounts, not a lot, but it is one of those annoyances for large employers that they do or do not know about it. Right. Well, it's not even large employers, it's small employers. So well, you can have to get it out. I think there's an income. Well, and like contractors, I think if you earn like a, there's a minimum threshold that if you earn X amount of money as a contractor in Denver, you're subject to the OPT. Um, 400 bucks. Pretty de minimis. So, right. yeah. And it's not the dollars necessarily. It's the compliance burdens. It's the compliance. Then, right. Then the penalties associated with the failure to comply where they get the money. It may be $60 in tax, but $100 minimum fine. For penalties yep. for not filing it. Correct. It's I I call them nuisance taxes because they really okay. get you, and they're one of those gotchas that you're like, oh, I didn't even know. And then you've got a lot of like ADP kind of knows a lot of this, but I'll tell you some of these small to medium uh, software companies or that are trying to outsource payroll. They didn't know about them. They're trying to get in that game because there's a big market for payroll compliance, but they don't know about these ancillary taxes. So we you end up going to this cheaper provider and then missing the ball on some of your local compliance issues. So taxpayers are like, what? <laughs> so. So then kind of transitioning that kind of using that gotcha as our transition point and kind of litigation. Jordan, what do you think have been some of the key court cases in 2023 or maybe tail end of 2022 within the last kind of 12, 15, 18 months that have been decided that, you know, are may even be continued on or, you know, that we should all make sure that we're reading and add to the repertoire of make sure you know uh, what you're I, talking about. Yeah, I mean, and I put down a couple, I thought about a couple of them and they're all different, but one of them, U.S. Auto Parts out of Massachusetts. I thought was a great decision. Forget about the fact that they're going only back a year from where they're allowed to impose a Wayfair standard. It goes a lot to retroactivity, what the Supreme Court said about nexus and passing laws and not uh, agreeing to go backwards with some maybe some constitutional restraints about it. It was um, states taking positions kind of randomly, not by that whole process where they adopted a regulation and it got challenged on procedural grounds got kicked out, they reinstated it, did it correctly, imposed it, and the court still said, no, it's more of a retroactive, and the old laws still apply, even though they were overruled. So I kind of like that. So I think one of the things that we have to be careful of, and particularly these taxes, is the retroactivity nature of them. We'll see that in Public Law 86272, which is a real big concern for me. But I like the fact, and it was a well-reasoned decision saying, here's what the court said. So people at this time this is what they relied upon. Forget about it's overruled. There's no way they can be clairvoyant and anticipate change in nexus rules and therefore mass you're out of luck. And I think that was, I, I understood mass's position. I understand the arguments and I do think the court got it right is that you can't expect people just to comply because the state says it's right. You know, our jobs are based upon saying, well, wait a second, is that not? And I think the way that that worked procedurally, first with the the, um, the improper publication of the re proposed regulations, 
first and then ultimately they did it correctly. I think those are some of the challenges that we're going to be have to look into is not just is the law valid, but especially at state and local levels in particular, is the process by which they impose them valid. And we're starting to see that uh, and, and things being kicked out. And, and, you know, another one, the American Catalog Mailer case out of uh, California, PL86270, California adopted it by bulletin, right, the MCC position, questions about what that meant. Well, the court on a motion for summary judgment, which they rejected, um, said, well, first off, there's not enough facts in the record for me to grant motion for summary judgment on behalf of American Mailer Catalog as to whether 86272 is being a supremacy clause applied retroactively, some of the issues associated with it. But what they did find, again, very important, is that by passing a bulletin under California law, that's the equivalent of a regulation, as it is in a lot of states, instructions to forms, bulletins, notes, memorandums of law they're considered to be regulations and if you're going to pass a regulation it has to go through a certain process and you have to have open comment and time for do it and and uh meetings and it's got to go for a first reading and a second reading and all the states are different it's a unique way to challenge things but it can be very effective and that's what american catalog mailer catalog did in california on a very big topic whether public law 862 should be changed they have a temporary win in that it might be invalid in that it didn't follow the process. So we have a couple of those. And then the last one I put down, which I love, was the Online Merchants Guild out of Pennsylvania. Again, it was challenging uh, the more or less retroactive application of Wayfair to some of the smaller remote sellers. And it wasn't the fact that they won and weren't, uh, and this has to do with uh, one of my favorite topics of property in a state, what's de minimis, what's not. So it has to do with a marketplace that has inventory, control of the inventory, ships the inventory, receives it back in damaged goods, collects all the money, but the online seller still has title to it. And the question before the court is, well, yes, that is an indice of ownership, but let's look at all the indices of ownership and title just title without control, all the other things, risk of loss, uh, shipping it out, getting it back, you know, uh, some merchantability warranties really isn't much of anything and found that the diminished amount of inventory based upon just having title wasn't enough. And I think as we go forward, physical presence is no longer enough, but it's still the standard, right? If you have physical presence in a state, that was always it, but free wayfair. And here what the court said is, it's got to be a bit more than even just title. And then he went even beyond saying, it's not enough presence, and I don't know if I agree with this, it's not enough presence even for you guys to send them Nexus questionnaires. There's a due process violation. It's not fair. You're asking a bunch of questions in this case. So not only are they don't have physical presence, you guys have to leave them alone if they're small enough and their presence is small enough, which, you know, it, the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue did a pretty nifty litigation type trick at the commonwealth court it's non-precedential and they didn't appeal it so they have a non-precedential adverse decision that i in a, a practitioners like us go out there and say hey this is a great decision this there's some really good stuff in here non-precedential but we still cite to it we still bring it up yeah well i think about some things we're seeing in colorado we've got home rule cities and we have this suck system for sales tax okay yes. well not all the cities are in it yet so we're 70 cities i think we got 59 60 and it's we're 10 away from full so now we've got cities coming out and saying we have a wayfair law because you have to comply with the state now you have to comply with our city how the heck do you deal with that as a taxpayer when you can't get everybody in the system the system's still a little clunky so why would you be able to put and is that really going to be allowed so i think we're going to you know taxpayers are going to lose by a thousand cuts because they're like whatever it's a small little town let you go but it's the bigger holistic view and then we have the other thing we have in our home rules is this what we call tabor violations where we have this situation where our home rule cities put a new law in place via reg without a vote of the people completely turn something upside down and say now we're going to treat it this way well that's not okay but who's who's watching that not taxpayers there unless they have an ability to talk to someone like that they get beholden to these notices and they go oh my gosh what do i do right 
You know, so. and, and for, from our perspective, I think it brings up a whole host of different type defenses. Because remember, mm -hmm. after um, after Quill, everybody thought due process would be dead in the state and local tax arena. But that's really what we're talking about. The whole reason mm -hmm. why the there's notices for regulations and public hearings and readings is to put people on notice, right? Mm -hmm. And they fail mm -hmm. to do that with whatever pronouncement they put out. It's a due process violation. Tabor mm -hmm. is adopting, saying to let everybody know, fair notice, right? You've got to follow these rules. Mm -hmm. That's what they try to do. Right. The other thing that... It, it, particularly in Colorado, and no offense to your hometown and the local jurisdictions out there, one of the things that we've had problems with is finding what the rules are. Right? right? No, no, I mean, no. You got you got written ordinances that are not really accessible mm -hmm. online, and mm -hmm. yet you're subject to them, and you're trying to figure out what they are. When does it apply? When did it go into effect? And so we have a project very, that you'd be so interested in. We're trying to comply with local jurisdictions. And we say, do you have a VDA program? Right. We are literally trying to raise the Congress people, the, the local council people to find the right person to find out who runs that and if they accept it or not. Oh, and we can give you that information, Jordan. We've done it ourselves finally. And okay. I shamed one of our cities just recently oh. because several years ago they did not have a program and they right away said, Oh, we do now. We have a program. Don't shame us publicly in this hearing. But we, you know, it's funny or they've changed the rules on the programs. Like, yeah. Oh, well, we're all going to do this or we're going to do that. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. We participated. You let us in based on a certain set of facts. And now you're going to say something different on an audit later. No, 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 no. That's not good tax policy. No, yeah. and we, we did get a couple of these, which is probably the worst answer you can get is um, we might have one, but don't worry about it because we don't have enough people at the city to do any audit. So just go ahead and start filing. And then you go to your, what do you tell your client? You say, well, I kind of talked to somebody who seemed like they knew and they said, don't worry about it. I can't give that advice. No, 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 no. And then we have this group called RRG, Revenue Recovery Group, which is a bunch of um, retired okay. auditors that there's a couple groups like this out there. So they have captive auditors that run out on behalf of these cities and take pretty extreme positions against taxpayers. Eight, nine year look backs. Wow. I mean, it's brutal because, you know, as you know, when it comes to this, we're not talking enough material tax at stake to actually litigate. You can twenty fifty thousand of a rearage, you're not going to litigate that. I'm extorted. No. Is the way I feel yeah. like some of this happens to our clients. It's not. It's not good tax compliance driving. No, no. You know this is this is <laughs> that's a, that's exactly right. It's it's the you know the million dollars for the Fortune five hundred is something that they can deal with and they can afford to litigate if they want or they just pay it and everybody like you know sorry you didn't do it. Mm -hmm. It's the fifty thousand dollars for a smaller retailer. It's coming right out of their pocket. They uh -huh. didn't reserve for it. They don't understand reserves. They didn't do it. They certainly didn't understand this compliance burden. And those are the ones that are really painful. And that's, you know, that's the hardest part about it. It's like you got to tell somebody, we can fight you. It's going to cost you a hundred grand to, to fight this twenty five thousand dollar issue. We may yeah. win, we may lose. We don't know. Right. And we're and we're fighting on principle. So thank you very much for being willing to raise the mantle and go after it, you know, right. and raise a charge. But you know, who's going to absorb that cost? Yes. Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting death by account thousand cuts in some of the locals, especially, but just some of these contrary positions. And like you said, with Pennsylvania, they don't really want it out there because I feel sometimes you find these regulators saying we don't really want it out in public forum because then we have to stick to it. <laughs> well, that, that we're on the record. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, anymore, it's going to be used against you on either position. Was it a good position? Was it a bad position? But somehow it's going to come back to bite you in the ass that, you know, by someone somewhere. No, no. I, I, I was raised with this principle is that as an advocate, I can argue both sides of any issue. And I actually think I'm obligated to do it. The state should pick a side, right? They have to decide what side they're on and go with it. Now, you may make half the people angry and half the people sad, but that's the choice they have to do. For advocates, we can argue both sides. And it, in fact, makes my wife very angry when I just play devil's advocate because that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a way of thinking for sure. But I just had a Tabor, I, you know, I said to this auditor, I said, it's a city issue. And I said, I'm just going to make you aware, like put it to assessment. We think you violated Tabor and we're going to bring it up through the system yeah. because we cannot comport to this. 
you basically change the character of our business and it impacts everybody in the same business like us. And is this how you're treating this one versus us? We're not here to make an example of this. And, and, right. and by doing some of these things, it actually creates a larger tax consequence to the taxpayer. So did your voters really want to pay tax that way on labor and in the inputs? I don't know right. that they knew that. Right. Yeah. Well, and with that, are there, Jordan, do you have any recent tax decisions that come to mind that you think were just bad? Like the outcome was bad. It was bad policy. It was just, you know, yeah, not well, great. Yeah, yeah the, the, the one that really, the most recent and really one that stuck to my craw because it was a really good decision up until it was decided by the Michigan Supreme Court is the Vectrum decision. Because um, it is an alternative apportionment. And just real briefly, the facts are, it's gonna, basically the facts are, it's a Minnesota-based company. Uh, they do 10% of their work in Michigan every year. Uh, in the year at issue, they got a major job there and 70% of their revenue for the year is in Michigan. So it's 10, 10, 10, 10, 70. And in the 70 year, they sell their business. Mm. And Michigan says, okay, you've got, we're not even arguing whether it's business or not business income. Business income, what's your apportionment factor for this year? Um, it's, you know, we're, we're going to exclude extraordinary gain out of the factor. So it's not where your intangibles are back in Minnesota. So we're just going on your normal operational business. It becomes 70% in the year of this position. Michigan said we got to tax 70%. So it went up on two, on two things. One is the enforcement methodology makes sense, excluding the extraordinary gain. And two, if it is okay under the statute to, extra, to exclude extraordinary gain, is this something that should be handled through alternative apportionment? And this has gone up and down to the Michigan Supreme Court a couple of times. And in each time they said, regardless of where we end up, the law says you exclude it. This is an extraordinary situation. You need to come up with a methodology for alternative apportionment. Then the Supreme Court remanded back down, worked its way back up. Taxpayer win, taxpayer win, goes back before the Michigan Supreme Court. And they go, um, you know what? We really don't see a problem. Sales factor is the way that we've decided to apportion income and therefore a 70% factor in the year of disposition, even though it's extraordinary to every other year before and after year sale, that's enough. No alternative apportionment needed. And like, this is the definition of alternative apportionment, right? It's, this is, you know, forget about what you do, whether the, the gain, the proceeds or the net gain is included in the factor denominator. If it's, if it's, we'll get to those cases in just a bit, let's exclude them. Go for, go up 700%, right? That's how's Reese on steroids. That was 260. This is 700% increase in what's due to the state because of an extraordinary transaction. And so, and in the dissent actually raised the issue that I think is most prevalent that I want to see litigation. I know we're going to get to it, but litigation in the future is why is the sales factor alone determinative of your income attributable to the state, right? Originally under UDITBA, right? We had three factor apportionment, equally weighted dollar of people, dollar of property, dollar of customer, all equally weighted to contribute to income for political reasons. We've gone to sales factor because it encourages businesses to move into your state because you don't count property or payroll. But now with this and then excluding gain from disposition, which generates income to the base, you've got a mismatch right there and it's been fought about and will continue to be fought about. But now it's just on sales. And the thing is, most of these gains in, in 2021, 22, we had a lot of large gains. Large gains are generally represented by something that doesn't exist until the sale, which is goodwill. Right. They say our assets are worth a hundred million dollars, but I got a billion dollars for the sale. Why? Goodwill. It's category seven on the appraisal list. Right. It's the last thing. Catch all. If you can't put it on any other asset, it goes into goodwill. And then the theory that I'm pushing for is what they're saying is that goodwill is only associated with where the customers are located. Right. That's the, it's not the fact that your people are great. It's not the fact that you've produced property that's great. It's the fact your customers are great. And we all love our customers. But to take all of that gain and say it's attributable to where our customers are is just false. Yeah. It's false no. narrative. And it's been an evolution. No it's been an evolution through the whole adoption of single sales factor 
Now we get these extraordinary gains and we're saying it's all, all the goodwill goes to where your customers are. And to me, that's a complete mismatch and something we're going to be needing challenges. So, well, so even in a the- large contract, there's no way it all goes to where you bill it. Most things are broad, right? If you think about a multinational company with a shared service center, you're billing one place, it's being used across the company. Yeah. So it's not even accurately reflective of like where it's the benefit is. Yeah, but, it's a really interesting world in this e-economy. And um, you, raise, you raise one of my bugaboos, which is billing address. That's what the statutes say. Uh, okay. Right? If you for guys, nothing else, yeah, where, where did you send your bill? You sent out a paper bill. <laughs> What's a billing People address? People don't even need? get addresses anymore. I mean, right? really, like small right. I mean, startup businesses, they just need a credit card. They don't even well, need an address. When was the last time you bought a book of stamps? Nothing is, it's delivered electronically. And yep. to your point, my service center can be anywhere. It could be a uh-huh. hundred people, two in every state. Yep. But they all have or access to it. Could be in India. Could be, in India. Know, could be anywhere. Mean, it doesn't even have right? to be in the US so to process billing, invoices. It, and we're relying upon this old fashioned, well, what do your books and records show? What your billing address is? It's not relevant anymore. It is a point in place, it's a point in time, it is something that exists. But with respect to matching up, where the benefit is received, where the service is received, where it's enjoyed, it's completely random, completely random. You know, and the other one, and, and you, Meredith, you, you hit me on my, I look at these cases, one that's making me crazy is the whole Comcast out of Maryland. And this is one of those things, and I love my partners, but sometimes we talk around the issues and we don't get to a resolution. And what they did here, not blaming the Maryland Department of Revenue for their arguments or the AG there, get to the issue. Is your law constitutional? They win on. You didn't raise it. Administrative Act. You did not raise it properly. You raised it because you didn't have a controversy in place and you need to be assessed or pay the tax. Answer the damn question, right? Answer the damn question. We all want to know, and all they've been able to do is great strategy in their part. Now this will go back, square one, take us another three to five years to litigate it properly, and then we'll have an answer. What happens during that time? Certain taxpayers are going to pay. Certain taxpayers are not going to pay. They're going to assess them. All the stuff's going to be backed up. If they ultimately win, they got interest in penalties, all the stuff going to back up. It's great strategically what they did, but from a try to answer the question, try to resolve the problem, it was the worst possible decision. Yeah, it's, it is. But so, that is such an interesting political and um, administrative issues that we see so much and it takes so long to resolve some of these cases. No, no. And, and I think they can do this right. There are ways to tax advertising uniformly, fairly, beyond the Internet Tax Freedom Act. You just got to do it that way. And Maryland's hasn't been done that way. When, when you say digital ads, you know, the argument that they made was digital is digital. Uh, digital advertising is different. And the judge who wrote the decision, which was ultimately tossed out, a puppy's a puppy, right? <laughs> puppy's a puppy. All the same. Dog's a dog. You call it digital. You call it, you know, a, a greyhound versus a, a poodle. But they're both dogs. And advertising is advertising. So, yes, you're doing it. But there's ways to do it right. Maryland has chosen not to do it what I would consider in a constitutional way. Um, but right now they've got the upper hand. Well, and it's sort of punitive. I feel like oil and gas was kind of a punitive tax, you know, the, all the excise and the whatever they were, ad valorem taxes on um, that industry because it was so pervasive. And then you just see these little taxes coming after large money makers and they're like, well, you're not paying enough. Like we need more because you're making too much money. Um, why is that? What's wrong with that? If they can okay, use their, good, their money for goodwill, right? Yeah. I, so I, I think it's punitive policy making. Well, I, it, it is. I mean, I, I understand. And one of the things that we do have to do as a country is get creative in how we're taxing stuff. As new products do come up, I think you're, the states are entitled to tax it. Well, let's figure out a way. You know, I, I've always, I've never, I've, I've applauded Ohio. Because Ohio generally does, let's sit down with the taxpayers, let's sit down with taxpayer representatives and hash out a system that we can all live with. Okay? No one's really happy at the end of the day. You know, I forget who the wise person who said it was one of the probably judges. You know, the perfect settlement is where both sides walk away dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. Okay? But they walk away and you have resolution. 
Ohio has done a pretty good job of getting together with taxpayers, taxpayers representatives and worked out a solution that nobody's happy with, but they've got buy-in, right? And when a state does it uniformly without that buy-in, you have these challenges, you have the things going on, it just gets litigated out, whereas you could take care of it, the ounce of, was it an ounce of prevention's worth a pound of cure? You know, I think states would be best served by actually working with the taxpayer community before they make radical changes and then get to a solution that we can still make fight about some points, but 80% of it, 70% of it is agreed to, and let's move on. I mean, but you don't find the tax community getting involved as much as you, I would like to see, right? Everybody complains, but nobody puts their neck out to help. I mean, a lot of people are like, I don't want to testify. I don't want to have my name showing up. Like, I don't right. want to get audited. There's this, there's this lack of, of personal, this, the, there is something to be said about grassroots efforts getting traction, but you got to get some grass, you know, and sometimes people just aren't willing to put themselves out there unless significant money's at state. They rather complain than take action. No, no, and you, you, we, we've lost a whole generation of those advocates that were in house that would say, we're going to fight this. We're going to fight this. And now it's, yep. and I understand it. I mean, litigation has gotten very expensive and so they don't fight everything, but you know, there are some, some organizations that is coalitions, which may be the way to do things. It's, you know, we've got that out in California with PL 86272. They have it in federal court in Maryland for, with the digital advertising. There are coalitions where you have somebody draws a short straw and they're the name litigant on behalf of a coalition mm -hmm. and the courts seem to be accepting that. Right? Yeah. So that's a way a to get join forces, you know, yes. and have somebody yeah. take the reins for that. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I think you're right. We don't have those one entity that's always fighting everybody, right? There's, there's, mm -hmm. we just, corporate America has, and for a lot of good reasons, knowledge, affecting customer base, a bunch of different things. You know, you don't know what's going to anger your base, your your customers, and so you try to keep a lower profile with those types of things. And yeah. we've seen in the news, uh, you know, the, the ramifications of sticking your hand up in the air and saying, I don't agree with that policy. And then, you know, one half of the country is angry with you and half love you, or the other half loves you, and the other pay hates you. So it's, it's, it's difficult. But as a coalition, I think maybe that's something we can work on on a go-forward basis. Then what do you think about the investee allocation cases? You know, the uh, VAC, uh, VAS holdings out of Massachusetts, Goldman Sachs, New York City, uh, Metropolis out of California. It's changed the game. And it's, I tell people this, I've been doing this long enough where it was, every statute was written as the intangible that you sell, ownership, stock, partnership, S-corp, whatever, resides in the back, wherever your cor corporate domicile is, right? So I've got gain on selling an intangible asset. It's commercial domicile. And what we've seen over the last year and a half, two years maybe, is this shift to investee, right? Mm -hmm. It's not where I'm located. It's where the business is located. And the fallacy there is that the value may be generated by the business, but the thing that was sold, the asset that was sold, is just ownership of the business, not the business. And I fail to see the legal argument that the sale of an asset is the same thing as sale of the thing that owns the asset. Mm -hmm. And yet the states are treating them the same and they're winning. And I think the reason why is because it makes sense that nuance between intangible and tangible is kind of fading in the court's minds. And it's like, well, the business, the assets themselves generated the profit. But if it was a building and you sold a building in Chicago, Illinois would tax the heck out of it, right? Yep. It's asset located yep. here. They get 100% mm -hmm. of the gain. I'm not sure why it changes with intangibles, but we're starting to see the states push back. And you know, we've had some minor wins, but there are states have a lot of major wins in this case. And they're getting there different ways. But I do see that as kind of a 2024 issue, the continuation of pushing out. It's not in it. It's business as usual. Where was your business? If I sold it day one of the year, if I sold it last day of the year, middle of the year, doesn't matter. In in Michigan, again, why the Vectrum decision is so offensive to me is that <laughs> it's an extraordinary year. And yet they're saying, we just look at the snapshot, 2017, 2019, whatever the year was, that's all we care about. What you did before doesn't matter. What you do after doesn't matter. We're going to look at this year and that's it. 
right? Even though 20 years of activity led up to me being able to sell my business for $90 million or whatever it was, or have $90 million of goodwill, it doesn't matter. Right. No, think about Arba Hammer baking soda, right? We used to use it a little pinch in our recipes. And then all of a sudden they figured out that if you put it in your refrigerator, it's, it absorbs all the bad smells, right? Completely revolutionized that business right? Mm -hmm. for baking soda. And all of a sudden everybody's got Arm and Hatter baking soda in their refrigerator to keep the smells out. Well, that, you know, that does not historical, just, you know, it, it, it's just a, a one-time event. It changed the things. And yet that's treated as just, okay, that whatever. Your sales went up. We're going to look at what you were doing on the first 364 days of the year, not on the last day of the year. Yeah. Well, it's frustrating too. It's like there's the position, right? Like you said, you know, we are here to argue two sides of a case. The state has the same ability and could do the exact same thing for an out-of-state taxpayer that's like, oh, well, or an in-state taxpayer that, you know, regardless, there's there's the contrary that the state can change their position on reasonably, and they will. Yeah, and that's, that's extremely frustrating, and, and, and I don't accept this as an answer. We're going to argue both sides of the case, and we're going to let the mm -hmm. courts decide. Right. States should have a position that they 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 the statutes written by the legislator, signed by the governor, Department of Revenue issues, bulletins, notices, regulations explaining it. There's got to be some culpability. There's got to be some responsibility that this is your position. Tell me your position you're charged with. And this gets into deference. Right. Departments of Revenue are charged with knowing the most about their own statutes and regulations. And because of that. They're given deference, okay? If they if they take alternative positions, that deference should be gone because they're saying, I don't know, go either way. Well, then you shouldn't right. be the arbiter, the final arbiter, the interpreter that's entitled to 55% burden versus 45% burden, right? They shouldn't be entitled to that because they haven't made up their minds. Well, and you don't obviously see the litigation if the state isn't asking for more. <laughs> I mean, if everybody agreed that you all lost, then we wouldn't be fighting about it. Because in the end, it's about a state taking a position to have more than maybe they, you know, people perceive they're entitled to. So it is them taking the possession that's in their best favor, which isn't always the best based on the facts of the taxpayer or the law as written. Right. <laughs> but, and, you know, we don't have a lot of tax people in there drafting statutes. That's one of our no. issues, right? And so the, the Scriveners or the, the writers of these things try to do a good job. I'm going to give them credit. They do a lot of it right. But words are so important. And in the tax world, hey, just think about this. I was just explaining to one of my young people. The difference between apportionment and allocation isn't necessarily true because legislatures use both words interchangeably. New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey allocation. Right? They're out mm -hmm. using allocation. really apportionment because they're looking at three factors. Mm -hmm. So... You know, that lack of uniformity among the states is also something that we're responsible for. We've got to fight through that. Yeah, composite versus consolidated. I mean, I think there's a mm -hmm. lot of things that are not always clearly understood, combined, consolidated. Like, I don't think a lot of practitioners always understand that. And certainly people who are preparing tax returns are not always attorneys. Right. So there's no. just a, di a very different mentality there. So interesting. It's Thought of some of those things, but it's very true. I, I, let, I had a conversation last week with a pretty seasoned accountant. And you, you, you guys will laugh at this. Meredith will laugh at this. It was a conversation that you may have had a dozen times last week. Was, okay, there's public lady 6272 out there, but a state's adopted economic nexus. And they've adopted the MTC, $500,000 of sales, $50,000 of property, $50,000 of payroll. Well, what if I go over 500000 and am I subject to tax? Well, what do you do? I sell tangible personal property remotely. Then you're still protected by 86272. It's, it's, to me, it's clear as completely clear, mm -hmm. but there's so much confusion out there because these statutes are saying if you have this, and it doesn't say paren unless protected by 86272, mm -hmm. which is if you have $500,000 of sales, you're subject to the income tax. Yep. And seasoned accountants, not necessarily state and local tax people, but seasoned accountants preparing returns are still confused by that lack of uniformity and lack of, of clarity that the states put out. 
No, because there's just, like I was saying, this um, the sets problem. Every city in Colorado that wants to participate in our sales use transactions and so yeah. has to have a Wayfair statute which says if you have nexus at the state, you have nexus in our city. It doesn't matter what the threshold is in the city. It just matters at the state. Well, if you read that law straight up, you think, I have to comply. And so they can use that to enforce even if the overriding situation is all cities aren't playing ball yet. Who now, knows oh, that part? I want it's you to roll secret. out. Roll out with all your power, with all your persuasive powers. I need you guys to go out there to every local jurisdiction and say, hey, if you want a wafer standard, wafer standard, adopt it. Just adopt it. Tell us what the rules are. Silence isn't going to Or tell us we follow state law and everything or something. Or for next, just do something. Give us a clue because without the clue, we don't know. It's not well, right, because didn't didn't Chicago do that within the last couple of years where they said, all right, well, Illinois got it. The city of Chicago is going to have their $100,000 threshold on there. Yeah. Which well, did make it easier. Well, it, that's a great point. And I've applauded the city of Chicago for doing it. I believe, I forget now, it was July 1st of 21. It was a go forward, safe harbor, $100,000. But then in audit, they would go back to 2016 and try to enforce it. And you would compromise based upon October 1st of 2018 when the city adopted when, it or the state adopted it. Or when it. state did. Because so, yeah. they said, well, it, we really didn't create a new standard. It kind of looks like a new standard to us. So oh, and I don't, I don't even know how city could enforce anyway. It's not, the wafer decision is not for cities. It's it was, for the states. Yeah. So I don't no. know, you know, but who's going to take that up to litigate it, depending on the money? Depending on the money. Right. So I applaud City of Chicago. They were out there. They wrote a bulletin and then kind of backtracked a little bit and didn't follow the words. <laughs> we have the same thing happening in California or Colorado, too. It's very oh. hard. It's disheartening, I would just say. <laughs> California, Colorado, Chicago, Cook County. We could just maybe it's just the C words. We're going to avoid yeah. all the C words. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Jurisdictions are going to be a pain. Truth. I mean, if there's anything else to take forward with you, they're just, that's it. But <laughs> we will kind of, as we wrap up, and you, Jordan, you had kind of mentioned this at least towards the kind of gain a alternative apportionment. Anything you hope continues to be fought, litigated, brought more attention to for 2024 going forward? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple of decisions that I think have to be done. Um, certainly the Amazon versus South Carolina decision as to whether a marketplace is responsibility and maybe they get into defining what it takes to actually have property in a state. That's the ultimate goal there. Now, in, in some ways, the retroactive application of marketplace may apply. I don't think it does. I think they're really getting into ownership, what it means. And for a long time, we've always thought that, you know, I, I remember this uh, with my older brother. We would have a football and be my football, and he would take it and go play with his friends. And I go, but that's mine. He goes, no, no, possession's nine-tenths of the law. We used to throw that out all the time, right? Didn't even know what it meant. Eight years old. My career in law was already started. Possession's <laughs> nine-tenths of the law. Didn't know what it mean. But possession might be nine-tenths of the law, right? Because if you look at the marketplaces, they have possession control. I've got ownership, but if it's in their warehouse and they've got risk of loss, and they control what it can be sold for and then where it can be sold and what they can do with it. Maybe you got to add all those things up. So I think mm -hmm. that the South Carolina v. Uh, Amazon decision is going to be important is defining what ownership is and therefore owning or defining what physical presence is and property is. So I think that's going to be a really important decision. Um, I don't know that Comcast v. Maryland, which we talked about, will anything will happen in 2024, but ultimately 25, 26. We'll get some decisions there about digital advertising, apportionment, fair apportionment, the impact of the Internet Tax Freedom Act, what is protected, what is not protected, the whole discrimination clause, can you discriminate against the Internet? Um, you guys, Wayfair v. Lockwood, right? Lakewood. That's, oh, Lakewood. I can't read yeah, yeah, Lakewood. Yeah. Um, Although, Lake okay, I, I got to clarify this one. I thought this was a retroactive Wayfair application case. But we just had the attorney representing the city speak at a task force meeting last week or the week before, and they had physical presence. That's what the facts say. So oh, I'm like, wait a minute. I thought this was retroactive enforcement of Lakewood, you know, having a, have a wafer oh. law. And it's, 
they haven't done all the deposition. There's still fact finding well, to be done. But if it, there was a physical presence, either their own trucks, deliveries, things like that, that's a different set of facts. Contractors, you can sign up to have someone in, build your microwave cart that you yep. bought from Amazon to kind of like Ikea. Well, see, so, but it's, it's physical presence historically. Okay, I, I have a, I have a question about that. And I get asked all the time about independent contractors performing services. If they're paid for by the customer, not by the company. Uh -huh. And I, my, my, um, comparison is I'm very fortunate here in Chicago. I get hired by people outside of Chicago to litigate a case in Texas, in Oregon, or in New Jersey, New York. Does the fact that they hire me as an independent contractor and I'm performing services for them in the city of Chicago mean they're subject to tax in Illinois? I'm an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. They're paying me to perform services yep. in the state that they benefit from, and they may benefit from it here. I always argue that no, professionals doing their job does not necessarily create physical presence. Independent contractor, some of the large, um, Department stores that sell things, they don't hire, they don't have contractors. They've got independent contractors that they have a website for, or they've got tear sheets on. Yeah. We don't install garbage disposals, but here's some people right. that do. And you call right. them up and you can track with them separately. Does that create physical presence in a state? I, you know, I, I'm not sure that it does because if so, all of the service providers that we represent, that we are, create nexus for everybody we do perform services for i i think that's a real push i think that's a real tough thing you know well, even i think of trade show nexus right just because it happens to be in nevada or anywhere else for that matter why is that enough to say you have nexus i mean fortunately we have a few laws that say not right. but right. still like people do things wherever they want to do things. I mean, that's not necessarily you're trying to build a market there. That's just a good location for people to come see your stuff. So I think that's a really interesting area that we're going to see uh, grow because you're just seeing more things, more places that really have nothing to do with a physical presence. Like I'm not really going here to build the market in this particular city or state. I'm just happen to join in with everybody else and that'll bring a bunch of bodies in to see my stuff. Wait, so, you know, purpose, I don't know. Purposeful availment, right? right? That's what it gets to, is right? That? Still yes. true. Is that purposeful availment? Are there other things that I'm doing and I'm there? Or is it just the fact that I'm there without purposeful availment? That doesn't make any sense because you're going to meet with, it's a private meeting, whatever. If it was in-house, it might be totally fine. But it's with some other people and we're all talking about the same stuff. All of a sudden it says, oh, you have physical presence. And then the question you raise is their purposeful availment of the marketplace. Right? Well, and think about having a remote video. employee. Why is that considered nexus? Give but, me a break in a way uh, that no way that person's making a market. It's just a random. They can happen to work from home and we like them. That is not is, enough to create a duty in my opinion that should go away my right opinion. and, and it, it gets back to what's physical presence where i'm hoping oh, yeah. we get some some hope in, uh, in wayfair v south carolina um judy froze up. Oh, i just Oops, fell off back. again i'm back there on yep <laughs> right, back to the on. remote employees remote employees i mean it still continues to be a major issue i i it, it, it's never good news when people ask me about it because i said if you have people there they're your employee that, I don't know any. Got all the duties, right? All the duties: unclaimed property, the payroll, you, sales tax, income to, tax. All of it, absolutely all yeah. of it. And I said, so decisions that we made three years ago will come back to bite you here. And you, then you have the question on a labor shortage issue: Can you afford to let these people go? Do you want to let them go? If they're a good worker, you absorb it just like any other thing else. For a good good worker, they get extra benefits. If they're not, yeah. you want to get rid of them anyway. It's a perfect opportunity to do that. You kind right. of take a practical approach. But you're right; it was, you know, it was done for necessity purposes, and now it's just been a thing. Yeah, and so, I was thinking that the average cost of compliance just to be in a state is probably three to five thousand a year for all the tax returns you got to file, all the duties you got to keep on top of. A lot of tech companies have no idea what that even means. You know, I mean, some people are just a pure remote. I mean, obviously, I don't. Even, are you the state? I just read an article. You know how we don't have enough housing, and they're thinking of taking over office towers and making them residential because yeah, no. there's just we need more human. We need, of course, these weren't built for a lot of toilets, a lot of sinks, a lot of whatever's. But we're, you know, we're not staying in our offices anymore. Right, it's a shelter. <laughs> that that and um, 
shopping malls for pickleball courts. That's the two big things of real estate right now. If you, <laughs> it's good use yeah. of real estate. There's kind of vacancy, tenancy rates are way down. Repurpose, redo it. I'm okay with that. Makes sense to me. Right, because um, you're but, not going to implode the building and bring it all down and start fresh. Right, no, way more expensive to do that. Although if anybody's done home construction, sometimes it would have been easier to knock it all down and start fresh as opposed to remodel and rehab. Uh-huh. I know that <laughs> feeling. I live in an 1895 Victorian. Our contractor's like, you see that building next door that got built from the ground up? Much easier than what I'm dealing with. Yeah. Figure yeah. out your attic. I got it. <laughs> All right. All right, Jordan. So I guess as we do wrap up, is there any, do you have any parting words, anything that you think our listeners should be left with other than your well, phone number for when states are really screwing things up? And I didn't realize you do litigation all over. So you'll do, you'll, you'll take a case all over the country, not just yeah, in Illinois okay. where you guys are headquartered. As active as Illinois is from time to time. Um, I like the diversity of not working just in Illinois. Uh, and I'm not worried about Illinois being flush with money anytime soon. So we'll always be looking for additional revenue, but I, I, I like working all over. It's just more fun going to see other people, different laws, different courts, different judges, different local council. It's just fun to do it that way. And that's something I've been yeah. fortunate of. And since I've started practicing, I've been able to go outside of Illinois, which is, and I would say Illinois may be my single largest state. It's close, but it's certainly maybe 20% of my business. So how that's a really big deal, though, because part of the reason I'm a lawyer that I never went to a law firm was being limited by licensure and feeling like people have troubles across the nation. I need to help them. Right. And um, and, and you don't always find that if you're too siloed. And there's certainly enough within a home state to, like, keep you busy. But it's the differences that you look at and then cost compare that helps you create better policy. Honestly, yeah. like, look how Texas is doing this. So and so I tell Colorado all the time, you see, Texas is collecting on behalf of like 1,714 jurisdictions, California 256. We can't figure this out. What is wrong with us? And we're oh, yeah, a very no, small we're, state. And we're so. like that as well. And we're a bigger state, but we have the same local jurisdiction issue. Um, you know, but it's interesting, just uh, on a side from say tax, Paul Franco, and it's kind of funny how many people don't remember Paul, but Paul litigated around the country. And what he said is I've got a network of really great friends that I trust and I get local counsel everywhere that I go. And I, that's what our practice is. I learned I was mentored by him. And so there's great people like you in Colorado that I can always reach out to and say, what's going on? Can you help me with this? There's plenty of work for everybody. All right. And it's just, it's the ability to have that network. And State low tax people around the country, we're a different breed. I think it's better. I think it's great. But we're a very close knit community that generally enjoys each other's company presence outside of work. And it's fun yeah. to work with friends. It just is. There's certainly about a mindset, though, that I think obviously you're a CPA. I'm a CPA and a journey. Like that's a kind of common mindset in the state and local area, I think, a lot of times. It because is. There's just so many bits and pieces of the compliance that you kind of need to understand. But so, in addition to understand the legal issues at hand, you know, exactly. exactly. Well, I think there no. does have to be that spirit of collaboration because you can't know everything in every jurisdiction. It's impossible. You so you have to re reach out to those local experts. No, and and the thing that you see being tripped up on it was a case just in. Ohio, I think it was, where they failed to preserve an argument that was the best argument. And the Ohio Supreme Court ruled against it because they didn't preserve it. Local rules, local procedural rules are so important. And I won't go into a state without contacting a friend in that state saying, okay, here's what, here's what your role is. I need mm -hmm. you to get it filed. I need you to do this. You need to advise me of what's unique about your process, your procedures, right. California, New Jersey, Oregon, Ohio. They all have these little quirks and you got to reach out to your network of friends to do that. Yeah, I but, recently lost an arbitration because we didn't know there was a 20 day rule for factual disputes. Not anywhere in writing. Yeah, but no, we it, were it, pronounced. Exactly. And that's why you kind of go in, you know, with a kind of defenseless, certainly behind the local person mm -hmm. that you're fighting against when you don't know the, the and you can't know all the, the local rules. You have to rely, rely upon others. But I, I do want to make this one comment. I want to put everybody on notice. We're going to see a lot, and we've seen it, a lot more audits going on. And I was kind of oh my gosh, thinking right? about that. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about it, despite the pandemic, 2021 and 22 were banner years for businesses. They were tough years for states 
to adapt. Business is adapted, a lot of M&A action, a lot of stuff going on in those period of time. The states actually took a step back because their auditors who were used to going to places couldn't go right. anywhere, right? So they're trying to catch up on all those years, all those big transactions, the increase in business, the craziness that surrounded remote selling, remote workers in 21, 22. They think there's a big boon out there that will take them through the next five years. And right now they're trying to step up and go after those years. So anybody who thinks, well, it's been quiet, I would say be on notice. Audits are going to step up. And the yeah. ability, automation, Teams, Zoom, all the video right. conferences that we use right now, they are used by the states as well. I, you know, one of the things that we used to do, you go to a state, you say, I'm going to be in the state, can we get together? It's almost impossible to do that with your clients now because they're not all at work. So I talk no. about that. Right? No. Auditors don't need to be at the corporate headquarters anymore. It's all from secure rooms off site where you download information. That's a heck of a lot easier than trying to figure out how you're going to be in Oregon and Texas on the same day. Yep. No, that's a really interesting shift. And obviously you're even seeing litigation. My husband's a litigator and he's like, Oh, I have something, a hearing. And he's like, Oh, it's remote. I'm like, I don't even have to show up. So he forgets that some things are in person and some things aren't, but it allows all the participants not to have to fly in um, in order to meet. Uh, so he's, you know, it's been a funny pivot for him because, um, you know, obviously things were that way during COVID, but now they're continuing that way as well. It's just easier. Right, because there's certain status conferences, it's no reason to go to court. If it's right? dispositive, evidentiary, Correct. different reasons to get to the face, you, every, you, you see coaching, you see other things. But, you know, uh, for court cases, every couple of months, you got a status that you show up for. And they go, well, how's it going? Oh, we're still talking about our stipulation facts. 30 seconds. And then you move on. Okay, I'll set it for another 60 days. There's no reason those have to be in person anymore. No, no. And the same it's, thing from the state benefit, side. Which is a benefit, I think. State side, you get an IDR. They send it to you. They put it in the, in the secure right? The secure messaging, right? Mm -hmm. You download it with your information. They look at it from wherever they want to. It's just more efficient and they can do a lot more auditors, a lot more audits because it's just going into a digital file somewhere, not right. physically looking at documents. And yeah. so the, no, it's well, and they can, amazing. we're in the middle of a Pennsylvania audit for one. I think this could be another point too, where they were, you know, kind of traditionally viewed as like a professional services firm, but, you know, kind of using computers as their backing. So in Pennsylvania, though, there's kind of a carve out for kind of generally stuff associated with a computer, but we're getting audited and, you know, we had to upload SOWs, whatnot to the portal. And then there's some like, yep, we can just immediately send them down to Harrisburg because they're the ones making all of the decisions. Like I'm local auditor. I'm basically collecting all the data, but I have it right here. It's going to go somewhere else. And there's like the, the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue brain trust sitting in Harrisburg. That's going to make all the decisions yeah. quick in, you know, with a lot of available information because it's all online. No, and think about the digital room, the SharePoints. The states now have the ability, and there was some talk about this before, and it got rolled out. They know by industry, right? That's what they should be doing. By industry, kind of what things should look like, what margins should be, what taxes should look like, what this will look like based upon your size and what you're doing. And they should be able to figure things out because it's, it's like AI. AI isn't art, it's not intelligence. It's the ability to know more stuff at the same time. Right. That's mm -hmm. I mean, that's what the great kind of fallacy. It's not they're not thinking on their own. The computers just have more information than anybody's capable of. Right. They can just grab it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So they can assimilate it so you can look at it all. Yep. One auditor does, does 10 audits of booksellers. OK, that's the only knowledge they have. The computer has done a thousand audits of booksellers, has all that much information, all that much data from all the different audits and does then saying, here's our standard. This is where you, the range people should be in. This is what we're looking for. And if you're outside that range, they could take a zero on it right away. And that's, that just makes it easier. That's why more people will be getting audits, not just the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, Fortune 5000, but smaller people because they can identify the one sore spot that this particular business has. So we're all going to start seeing these kind of electronic notices and electronic audits. It makes some sense. And if you go to any of the conferences put on by FTA, Masada, Masada, Mistoa, uh, CETA, the thing they talk about more than anything else is automation. 
Hmm. Everything's about systems, about needing less people to do more. And that's why we're going to see more and more of this because it makes sense. That's where we're going as a world. Yeah. Well, with that, Jordan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your time today. Don't tell me it's over. <laughs> we could do a part three in another 15 months, mid-24. Just keep coming back. Um, it's just so easy to talk to you guys. There's so much going on. All right. Well, this is another episode of Saltivation. Till next time.